Right, there we go. We're rolling. So, I've been thinking recently. Yeah. People aren't getting enough advice from their grandmas, the 80 plus, the, the elderly people. Because what do people do in life a lot? They make mistakes, right? Okay, yeah. Every, like, we all make mistakes in life. And then how do you not make the same mistakes or make similar mistakes again? You learn from that experience. Yeah. Who have the most life experience in society? Apart from maybe rappers. <laughs> but old people. Yeah, old people, kind of. But like, when does anyone say, hey, what's your, what's the, what's the one thing you would, one piece of advice you'd give someone in life? Like, when does anyone say that to an old, a real old person? Because surely they got some answers, no? Think how much they've seen, the number of politicians they've seen, how many, what was it, the four year cycle? Yeah. Like, you live, you lived 80 years, think how many politicians you've seen, think how many, I don't know, all kinds of stuff like that. Yeah. The point is though, mm. even though they give some of their advices, it's not that it's completely applicable in this generation as well, because quite a lot of things have changed in the society, how the systems work. Yeah, people have become more cunning and cruel. But back in their days, I'm not saying that they're not cruel and cunning, but now we started defining cunningness and cruelty and greed in other forms. Like, Ooh, yeah. I like where you're going with this. It has been redefined. Yeah, yeah. For sure. Well, even in like the Western countries, the things like the corruption, they just hide it better. <laughs> like the country, the more. The more you understand about yeah. how countries operate, governments operate, big companies operate, like people, it's the world is chaos, isn't it? It's really survival. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I I still think they would have some good advice though. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah don't know, but uh, as you said, it's all about life and death or living. Uh, we've evolved from just fighting for survival you know it was the situation back then well some countries some involved. countries <laughs> um, for, some through no fault of their own but yeah. yeah yeah but still like from the early human stage we've evolved from uh, life and death it was only survival or death it was fight or flight yeah mm -hmm. so now we are still living we have created everything on this planet that supports better life for us not for the planet only for us yeah, probably not for the, no, definitely not for the planet. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So now, yeah, yeah, things have changed. I'm not saying that grandmother's advices won't be uh, useful in this generation, but they might not be the 100% advice. Yeah. It's, it won't fit it, in the, you'll, you'll this have situation. To, you'll ha well, I think you have to know the person well to know the scope of their active learning and knowledge before they got really old, you know what I mean? Because some people will learn and just have a better understanding of the world because they're actively reading and trying to work things out, whereas most people are just like, love Ireland, um, <laughs> uh, you know what I'm saying? And then read the occasional news article. But, but if you, I think if you chose an intelligent one, like an ex-professor, you know, like an academic, some of these academics work until they're pretty old, don't they? Yeah. Like, like the professor. Yeah, if you, had like experience a, if you had like a 85 year old professor from Cambridge or something, former Cambridge professor, okay. like one of the best professors, scientists, academics in the world, like having been alive for 80 years, I reckon that's a pretty good gauge of. Yeah. I don't know, maybe. Could be. If, if it's like a teacher working in the industry, you could have seen clear shifts of how management has changed when you're talking about industrial revolution mm. yeah different phases of industry yeah you could have seen different things from management side of how things have changed like how people were being controlled back then on how now we have better systems like giving them pension or regulation probably, yeah <laughs> probably and bodies to yeah. monitor things going yeah. wrong and yeah Mm, the regulatory bodies. I remember, probably can't, definitely can't say his name, but <laughs> I was getting taught years ago by this professor and at a university. Yeah. And he was basically talking about the hedge fund industry and how 
they can't regulate it. Like the the firms are too powerful or something. <laughs> they just casually dropped it in. <laughs> like the regulators can't approach this industry because it's too powerful. Yeah. If you're talking about only hedge fund and the companies that can't do, imagine the power the banks have. Oh mate, we can't. <laughs> we're like two minutes in. We can't just start talking about banks. <laughs> we're all like some mad conspiracy theory guys <laughs> on the internet talking about central banks but for sure for i sure. mean the reality is uh joe biden you know he was trying to push you know he was trying to push like f trillions of dollars worth of spending like you know the 1.7 trillion dollar infrastructure bill yes in yeah. the u.s yeah. yeah that's that passed through the house but hasn't passed through senate yet but basically he was trying to pass that and he was trying to pass another separate renewable energy or, or build back better bill as well. He was trying to pass through bills that, that allow the government to spend trillions, like two trillion dollars or something. Yeah. But to, for that money, he borrows that money off the Federal, Federal Reserve, Reserve, right? Yeah. So uh, the President of the United States has to go and ask to borrow money off someone. I mean, Somebody. in your life, have you ever borrowed money <laughs> off anybody? What's the, um, you know, if, so, if you're borrowing money off someone, they've got a little bit of control over you, haven't they? Yeah, the one who's lending us most of the control, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. like, he decides the terms, you have to give it. Mm, so. From a psychological perspective, I just find it interesting how, I don't know, the power works. Because so many people, like smart people, just get addicted to power, don't they? <laughs> I think yeah. how old some of these politicians get. <laughs> okay, yeah. Did you just have control? Yeah. That's true though. Hmm. But I don't know. Power, things like that. But yeah, so tell me the news about the watches. You wanted to talk about these watches? Yeah, so apparently Omega has uh, collaborated with Swatch. So Swatch is like a parent company of Omega and uh, it owns majority stake of Omega watches. So to, uh, a week ago, they announced that uh, they're going to collaborate and uh, replicate the inspiration from the Omega Seamaster. Oh. Yeah. So... I'll put a picture of this up on the screen in the edit. Yeah. So, it's not... Uh, Is this the one with the black strap? Yeah. It's not Omega Seamaster, it's Omega Speedmaster for people to properly understand. So... Uh, it, instead of the stainless steel case that came with the original watch, this is uh, kind of like a ceramic kind of plastic blend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's like uh, new ceramic or something. Mm -hmm. Now keep bit. talking, just like maybe shower a little bit. I'm just going to go grab my hat from yeah. the other room. Yeah. Uh, I, I so with this thing. Yeah, keep shouting. Yeah. Shout, but move further away from the microphone. Yeah. So with this watch, uh, watch, you don't get this watch everywhere, uh, you don't even get in uh, official Omega retailers, but you do get them only at Swatch retailers, not even Omegas. So because you get them, it, it, it was on sale for only one day, which is today, and uh, it was not in everywhere, it was in major cities. In London, we had only three places that uh, serve in the UK. Yeah. We had London and we had Edinburgh. That's Do Omega it. have their own shops or is it a, a, like a chain thing? No. Like a, a non it's, it's shop. Both of them are separate. The Bayern company has a separate store and the Omega has a separate store. Yeah. So with this watch, people started queuing up outside the store, maybe like one or two days before, started to camp there, wait for the watch to open. Yeah. And it's a 200 pound watch. 200, yeah. Roughly 207 or 210 pounds. I mean, you've been out at night recently. The evenings aren't that warm, are they? <laughs> you, you're doing that for a 200 quid watch. It does watch. look really nice, really though. Nice stuff, yeah. yeah. It looks really nice. But yeah, and as Swatch, the company said, this is not a limited timepiece, but they didn't mention how soon they'll release the next batch of the product. Mm -hmm. next That's stock. kind of what um, OPEC do with oil. You know, mm. you know what I mean. I love it. Yeah, it, it's. Go on. I like it how um, companies do that. They have when they have control of the supply of something. Yeah, that's that must be that's, that's real that's, power. That, that's power. <laughs> that is real power. Yeah, but even like small firms and things. Yeah, but no, talking about watches. 
Yeah, I don't know anything about watches, but you know how De Beers, yeah. for decades and decades and decades, were the were they a, an actual monopoly? They were a monopoly, so they they were literally had the the main control over the supply of the world's diamonds. Yeah, and yeah, it's just kind of strange, that, isn't it? Kind of, yeah. Imagine it's kind of powerful. Think how much we value diamonds. Humans do. They're they're pretty much the most expensive stone on earth. And you have the entire control over the supply yeah. of this stone. But I, I want to try find an article on it, but it is monopoly diamonds. So speaking of diamonds. Okay. Yeah. So from its inception in 1888 until the start of the 21st century, the beers controlled 80% of the world's diamond distribution. And was considered a monopoly. Yeah. Unbelievable. That's Business Insider. Unbelievable. Sorry, what are you saying? Yeah, speaking of diamonds, you know diamonds lose their value once they started, once they have been cut. Yeah. Mm hmm. That's why you it's say it's always better to buy gold. Gold, yeah, anytime. Because gold, you just melt it back down. Yeah. You get it back. Mm. What's the most amount of gold you've ever seen in your life? Don't me, you, me in my life. I know you've seen. I know you. I know. I'm <laughs> saying this because I know you've seen a massive amount of gold. Yeah. But if I say don't say who it is, but if anyone watches this that knows <laughs> you, it's obviously you're gonna know. I can't doesn't have seen many. <laughs> you've seen some bars though, haven't you? Yeah, definitely. How beautiful is it? Was it the most beautiful thing you've ever seen in your life? These bars we've got. It must look good. Yeah. Looks really good, man. Yeah. Is it, is it like a drug? It just drags you in? And... Uh, nah. It is like an addiction that makes you buy more, like more and more and more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's why imagine kings used to fight for gold. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it's not out of the realms of possibility to argue that sometimes they still do. Yeah. Did you hear about the. Uh, it's quite a popular sort of consensus of belief in a lot of Arabic countries that the Iraq gold reserves were stolen. Uh, okay, yeah. The Iraq yeah, missing yeah. gold. Yeah. But the Iraq missing I'll try to search it. Was it worth ten billion? No? No, nah, probably more. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's. They see. I can't quote from Wikipedia. Now look for a news article. Kuwait's lost treasures. Uh, I think we've seen it on. Uh, the hunt of Iraq's lost treasures, two thousand five. Yeah. I think we've seen it on the DW documentary. I think. No. Maybe. I'm not sure. Yeah. I can't remember to be honest. Uh. Okay. I found something. Yeah. The U.S. seizes what may be five hundred million dollars worth of gold in Iraq. Hmm. That's from the New Zealand Herald. Never heard of that paper. <laughs> That's very interesting. Five hundred million. Did we do gold on the last episode? Sorry. We we did gold on the last episode, didn't we? We looked at the world's gold reserves or not? We looked at well, we lithium reserves, I think. Because he, we, last week we spoke about Elon Musk, why he's trying to help Ukraine, because it says... Ooh, guess how much gold in tons the Bank of England holds? In terms of tons? No, tons. You know what a ton is? A thousand, thousand, a thousand kil kilos is a yeah. ton. It's got this French spelling, mm. T-O-N-E-S. 50 tons? Not a million miles away, but not super close. 310 tons of gold. Oh, shit. Yeah, that's pretty... How much would fill this room? How many tons? Ten? No, not ten. Less? Uh, plus? Like, uh, one kilo of gold, but... Probably like one and a half ton, I think. Easy. One and a half ton. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You might like, yeah. What does a ton of gold look like? <laughs> Here we go. Because it's not actually that dense of metal, is it? No. 
I don't know. Wait, let's try and be accurate. The point is though, most of the stuff you see in here is not. That could be like a big cube. If that's the case, that cube's 30 centimeters. Yeah. Nah, it's got to be bigger than that. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, the point is though. What are you saying? Most of the stuff, or the gold that's in here, we don't really know if it's actual gold or... Because if in results at all, the actual pictures don't come up, so... Yeah. yeah. When have you ever seen? <laughs> like one of the, you know what I'm saying? The, like, one of the Bank of England managers taking a, a selfie. Selfie, in the yeah. No one sees what's inside that vault. Hmm. That is interesting. No one sees. Who owns the world? The United States holds the largest stockpile of gold reserves in the world. It's got 8,000 tons. Oh, shit. Fucking hell. Try checking how much India has. India, yeah, you, yeah, you can. Eight thousand tons. That's that's good. That's a nice amount. I still think there's gonna be some under the Antarctica. They just haven't explored it yet. Yeah. If the ice has been there for a hundred million years. There's uh. Versus... So India has like seven hundred eighty to eight hundred tons. You got well, over twice as much as England. Yeah. I'm so I thought England robbed it all from you two hundred <laughs> years ago. <laughs> Because they did absolutely crucify you as a country. Do you like this? Is what we wanted to talk about actually. Yesterday, how um, it's funny the uh, state run education systems and the contrast because you were shocked, as I was shocked yeah. when I learned and came home and told my parents one time how the state. British education secondary school system in around like 2012 when I was there yeah. weren't teaching anything like I didn't know anything about the British Empire <laughs> what our empire did what they did to countries I mean it was the largest empire in the world by landmass yeah. yeah it was a huge empire like 180 years ago yeah why is the state education not teaching that and they, but you got taught it in India, didn't you? Yeah, we got taught. And what did the British do to you? <laughs> took away most of the valuables, like, yeah. They took away the fertile soil, mm. yeah. Tried to grow opium in India because the land is very fertile, yeah. And then they started, the East India Company started to export tea as well, mm. yeah. And other items, gold, diamonds. Well, as we've talked about in a non-video episode, but, uh, <laughs> but no one watches that, <laughs> so we might as well mention it here. <laughs> is it called the Koh-i Noor? Koh-i Noor, yeah. The Koh-i Noor, yeah. and it's like, is it the biggest diamond in the world? I think it's the highest, it's the diamond with highest number of carrots until this card, I think. And what happened to it? I don't know the actual fact, but the Queen says some king of India gifted it to her. But I don't think so that happened. I mean, now, some people do give them gifts when they visit, but to give the biggest diamond in the world to somebody. Yeah. And what what does the what do they say in India that didn't happen? No, in, I in India is the belief that the the king gave it. Didn't give. Didn't, didn't give. Didn't give. So yeah. people in India think the queen the, 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 the diamond wasn't given. Yeah. Yeah, we're taught it was given. <laughs> Interesting, but don't yeah. you know, that's messed up the school thing. Yeah. Why are people not learning about that? It's, I don't know, man. It's interesting. Yeah. It's just like one of the main inconsistencies. I know. Have you found anything? I'm trying to see if uh, someone actually gave the diamond to the British Empire. Ah, uh, okay. I think these are. So we need to get someone else who just sits and types and searches. Yeah, but still, uh, given that the podcast is an initial stage, I think it's, yeah. it's a lot better if we understand the things of how typing works along with recording the podcast. You can, you can put this experience to someone else, teach them, and probably hire them. That's the reason why you're trying to train them, and then probably... 
Yeah. I think along with his skills, your experience will add on. So yeah, that'll be very easy. I mean, he'll be learning to do things the way you want it, want the articles to show, or the research to be done at. So he he kind of like follows your technique, like. Mm, it's passing on knowledge. Knowledge, yeah. There's like the skills. There's certain skills that people that like live in the countryside and like well, it's not Aboriginal, but you know people, people that live off the land have so many skills that get passed down through cultures. Yeah. And like the tribes, tribes and things yeah. like that. Like farmers, you know? yeah. And you got you got to pass skills, but it's it's funny. Um, see, I don't think as a nation like our regulation of enforcing companies and stuff to pass skills really isn't that great i i remember it was it was a few years ago it's like a 2018 or something i'm gonna have to search stuff put on the screen but report and it was about the social social mobility in the united kingdom statistics okay. which is basically how easily you can kind of switch between like occupations but but moving up moving up yeah. you know and the UK actually has like a terrible rating of it, meaning that the, the it's not really a class as such, but do you know what I mean? The, the ability to retrain in work is kind of what it is. Wait, let me try and find some. Is... Yeah, here we go. Oh no, let me just get rid of this. Okay. <laughs> UK has worse social mobility record than other developed countries. Children from poor families in Britain have a greater chance of struggling on low income than their counterparts in the West other rich countries, the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development said today. And this was in The Guardian 12 years ago, but still, <laughs> not quite 2018, <laughs> but maybe it hasn't changed. We can change it. Uh, okay, here we go. Yeah. The Paris-based think tank said the chances of a young person from a less well-off family enjoying higher wages or getting a higher level of education than their parents are relatively low. Hasn't changed much. That's not good. Yeah. So the article now we are reading, uh, uh, how many years after the, it is? Twelve. Yeah, that was the article you first read, that was 12 years old. Oh, the original? No, the one you read now. The last 12 years old. 12 years old, okay. So both of the articles you read. No, one was 2018, the thing I read, saying that the UK has poor social mobility, I think it was around 2018. Okay. But yeah, that's not good. Yeah. What kind of job are you going to go for? Something to do with finance. Banking, investment banking, mm -hmm. private equity, hedge fund, yeah, so portfolio seen... management, yeah. You want to try again to develop? Yeah. It's super, I'm not saying, yeah. it's super competitive. Yeah. Ridiculously. I had an uh, ex-girlfriend who got, became an investment banker at, one of the big banks, I don't want to say his name, just because, <laughs> for, for obvious reasons, but basically, she said when they did the applications just for the summer internship, the, uh, it was 7,000 applications for seven places on this internship at one of the big, like, big top five okay. investment banks in Canary Wharf. Yeah. Imagine that, a thousand to one <laughs> were her chances, yet she got it. That's mad. That's some, that's some serious yeah. odds. That's 0.1% chance of succeeding. 1% is 100. Yeah, 0.1. Yeah. 0.1%. Yeah. So imagine if you got told something, you got 0.1% 0, 0 chance of succeeding, yet yeah, your life ambition is on that. Because her life ambition was on that. Yeah. Now, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, she, she reached, like, she said from a young age, from the age of like 12, 
she wanted to be a banker. What kind of 12 year old? <laughs> I didn't even know what money was until I was like 14. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. That's, it's, it's, it's interesting. But if you're doing things like that, like there are harder things and the odds are stacked further against you. Like, um, being on the, like, Brazilian football team or something. Country obsessed with football. 11 places to play football on that team. Yeah. How many, what's the population of Brazil? It wasn't the best of attitude, but I was kind of... No, but still... A lot of people play for okay. Two, the, the population of Brazil is 200 million. How many people play football in Brazil? It says registered players, but that must be for club. That's 13 million soccer players. Out of? 30, Brazil has 13 million soccer players out of a population of 200 million, but think 13 million soccer players, 11 places in that team. No, but not all, every soccer player wants to be playing the national team. No, so you think if you're playing football for Brazil, you wouldn't want to play for Brazil? No, it's, it's could, not it could everyone be has the skill ability to be, like there's only, not all of those 13 million will have a shot at it. You know what I'm saying? A lot of them are just playing for, play, for fun. For fun, yeah, that's what I'm saying. So. Yeah, I see what you're saying, mm. but I think, um, yeah, there's still mad odds. But but what I'm saying is like the like the final. But still, yeah, I get it. It's the, yeah, things yeah. are the same for with uh, cricket in India. We have so many teenagers, youngsters playing cricket, who want to play for the Indian team. There's a lot of competition. Mm. Yeah. No, I think. Um, the Indian cricketers are going to become, in 30 years time, Indian cricketers will be the biggest celebrities on the planet by miles. Uh, I remember reading, uh, it was ESPN's uh, top wealthiest sports stars of the year. Okay. And so many Indian cricketers are getting in the top 100 top now. Yeah. They weren't five, 10 years ago, but it's because like you're, before COVID, the Indian economy was growing really like twelve percent a year. Yeah. That'll double in like six years. Yeah. That's 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 incredible growth. And, uh, and so yeah. You're gonna have more wealthy people and a cricket obsessed nation with all these wealthy people, middle class wealthy people. Yeah. Uh, it's just gonna be so much money pumped into the cricket tournaments and stuff there. Because the IPL has just put two new teams on, right? Lucknow Super Giants and someone else, another team, but basically it was like a billion dollars. People were paying a billion dollars for a team. Team, yeah. I think. Wait, let me double check that. Yeah, meanwhile, while you're checking, uh, we are speaking about Indian cricketers getting rich and rich. Uh, you know who is the most followed Instagram cricket celebrity? Pratt Kirby. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's mad. Million. Yeah, now oh, I follow him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's mad, isn't it? Out of all the countries, all of the popular players, he still got 142 followers. 142. 42 After million. All the yeah. uh, a million. <laughs> He's got almost as many million followers as I have followers. <laughs> you mean for your podcast channel? Well, anything. Um, yeah. Here we go. Over a billion, one, an eye-popping $1.7 billion was committed by two investors to buy two new teams of the Indian Premier League. So each team's like $800 million, which is $800 million for a team. It's pretty darn big. But in 20 years' time, that will be worth billions, <laughs> won't it? Once now COVID's getting out of the way, the Indian economy is going to... Is this still going to grow loads or did it just get hammered? I haven't followed it since. Nah, it will still grow. Yeah. Mm. It will still grow. Yeah. Like a billion people, bro. Yeah. As they get educated, service providers, yeah. all sorts, like... 
You're in a sweet spot, your country, right now. Yeah. Over the next 20, 30 years. One of the best countries to start investing in to grow, like, yeah, business, start up anything. Because it's not like it's risky, like it's going to get overthrown. Yeah. Mm. I feel like land, though. No, no. There's still many places in India that are not cities, like, you know? Uh -huh. 60% to 70% of Indian population lives in the villages only. No, really? The rural areas. Yeah. I mean, well, I'll, I'll add it on later in the edit to what the actual number is. You seem quite confident then. Let's assume you're right. Yeah. <laughs> that is, so ur urbanization is coming and it is, it's not here already. No, it isn't here already, but it's going to continue. Yeah. Urbanization, it's on an upward slope like this. We'll also have this on. Do you think we do too many facts in this? Yeah. Or is just. So now, mm -hmm. out of 121 crore Indians, and crore is like a, an Indian currency, 83.3 crore live in the rural areas. That's like 70%. <laughs> so you're spot on. Yeah. I rate that. We'll put so it on once the, the rural areas start. Uh, coming to develop, get into cities, so the standard of living will be increasing. So yeah, more better jobs and then infrastructure, all of the developing countries' mm -hmm. requirements mm -hmm. will be matched. And yeah, finally India will be a developed country. So. Yeah, sorry, uh, Raj just messaged. He said, um, in Westgate, which is I think it's like some pub thing. They're showing the uh, IPL tomorrow at 11. If we, should we go to that instead of watching it here? Ah, uh, no, no, it might be expensive. Want to drink there? Uh, but yeah, I don't we, like. I'm not gonna have mad drinks. At I don't like both of the teams. Like you don't. Yeah, but I don't like. I'm not, I don't even know if I'm gonna have that many drinks there. I'll just have because it's an 11 a.m. I've got work and stuff to do later. I'll just have like one, and then you know. no. So you wanna watch it here? Uh, I watch it when. We have uh, a good team, like SRH. <laughs> so you don't want to watch Delhi Mumbai, two of the best teams in the tournament. <laughs> because if you're, yeah, you know, you're, you're growing up there, it just gives you this, gives you this unwaverable <laughs> bias. <laughs> this blinding bias it gives you. I mean, I think we both established Sunrise and Hydra about going to be one of the worst teams. In the tournament because they just didn't they let go of all of their good players. <laughs> David Warner, Johnny Best, no Rashid Khan. Yeah, I don't know why. Think how much better they all are than Kane Williamson yeah. in, in the IPL. I don't know why they let go of Rashid Khan. Yeah. He is a superstar. Yeah. Best T twenty bowler in the world. Oh. In the world, a leg spinner. Yeah. And like I watched a um, sky analysis of the breakdown of his bowling and practicing. And they were like, how did you, because he just holds the ball so differently. It's really, yeah. And they're saying, how did you learn to do that? And his, his answer was basically, you know, I taught myself. I didn't get coached, I taught myself. And that's what there is this argument that over coaching, you owe, like in England, we over coach the players. Yet sometimes if they have this mad talent, Creative, it, it, yeah. also, it kind of stops it. But yeah, because he, he's a real fast leg spin. He bowls at 60 mile 60 an hour mile, for yeah. leg spin, which is pretty damn quick. Yeah. 60 mile an hour is cool. Mm -mm. I don't know, he's like one of the best players for FH. Was. Was. <laughs> Did you ever see them live? Nah, nah. Did you ever see any of the players in the city? Yeah, in the city I've seen. You've seen them before? Yeah, yeah. Uh, how big are the crowds? When I have seen... Uh, it was kind of not that busy. Because I've seen two of the cricketers in the early morning time, so kind of like 6.30 or 7 in the morning. So there's not mad crowd. Uh, okay. Yeah. Which one did you see? I've seen Ambati Raidu. Didn't you used to live near Ambati Raidu? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Somewhere nearby. How rich is he? Uh, not like super rich, but yeah, he's good man. How much do you think Dhoni's worth? I know we talked about Dhoni last time, but he is a cultural icon. Yeah. His biopic on YouTube got 90 million yeah, views, the trailer for yeah. the film. Yeah. How much do you think he's worth? 100 million. It's a cool 100 M's. Yeah. 
Mani just said Donny. Trim four was that? Let me see. Donny has. How much longer do we go for? It is 862 crosses, 110 million. 110. Yeah, that's, so, that's so close. Did you see uh, Conor McGregor? Uh, got 300. So sold his stake in Proper 12 Whiskey yeah. for half a billion. Yeah. Half a billion dollars, baby. I know. Imagine you have 500 mi million dollars sat in the bank yeah. account. But you know, uh, if you track the growth of Proper 12, the company, they're growing at such a quick rate still. I think he sold too early, which sounds ridiculous, 500 million dollars, but I really do think he sold his stake way too early. If it's growing at such a rate, Obviously, what's the life cycles you say, the product life cycles? So you have infant stage. Mm -hmm. Like a startup. Yeah, startup, like crazy tiny. Then you have growth stage. Like when it's booming with the uh, higher rate, higher increasing rate every year of the growth percentage. Then you have maturity, where the business is still making money, but it isn't growing. Then you have the decline stage, which is the last the business starts to fall down. Mm -hmm. So, so w while you're in your maturity stage itself, you have to try going back to infant stage or growth stage. So if you start to decline, it's really difficult to pull the grass Turn up again. Things around, yeah. get things back on track. Yeah. Yeah. No, I understand. Oh, maybe too far from my microphone. So I suppose what he was terrified of of it falling into even the Again, joy yeah. stage or, or quickly the declining stage because there's no defined uh, time frame how long these companies stay at these stages. The point is though, because now he sold off his share for 500 million, you think the company will grow given that he's out of the business? Uh, yeah, because I, I, I mean, think there's still yeah. a deal There's still a deal where he promotes the company on his Instagram and stuff. Okay. And the whole reason the company grew was through his Instagram. Because I believe, like I'm fairly certain, there is a deal still in place where he promotes it. In fact, if you look on his Instagram, he's posted pretty recently about Proper 12. But, um, I mean, the reason why the company grew so much that he made the 500 million was virtually entirely through his Instagram. Because if you have... How many followers? I think he's got like 40 something million, hasn't he? What's the number? Do you think we do too many numbers and statistics in this show? So he has like 44 million followers. Yeah. Which is pretty enormous. <laughs> 44, 44 million. million. Imagine yeah. picturing 44 million people. Yeah. Like, you can't. I think I can picture about. 5,000? <laughs> it's insane. Yeah. It is insane. And that is mad. People love him so much, they yeah. just buy his product. He's so savage, like, that's why people love him. He is so savage. Well, yeah. he's, a, he's a raw man. He's a yeah. raw fighting man. Yeah. Some men can't be tamed that easily, you yeah. know? Yeah. Like, society isn't perfectly suited to someone that jumps in a cage and tries to be the living daylights out of another man every day. Yeah. Society is perfectly suited for yeah. someone that like earns a lot in an office job or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Abides by the rules. Like, like it's just different. Some people are built different. Yeah. Speaking of boxers, do you like Khabib? Well, he's not a boxer. He's an MMA fighter. But yeah, <laughs> close. Yeah, I do. Okay. Even Corner is an MMA fighter, right? Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah, he is. Yeah. They're both. But yeah, I do like him. Why do you like him? Why do I like him? Because he's like a... He's from the forest, they say. He's from the Dagestan mountains. I mean, like, region. forest as in, like, raw. Yeah. That's, that's where they... Oh, for the sure. real strong day. Well, everyone's already anything. talked about. But you know, yeah. he, he wrestled bears and shit growing yeah. up. But the people of Dagestan, when he won, they were out in their vehicles, like shooting, shooting machine guns up in the air, celebrating in the towns and stuff. Oh. These are hard, like, yeah. honourable men. Real life survival, survival. Real yeah. shit. Yeah. Like, people survival. don't realise. What's the stat? If you're in, you're in the top one percent of world earners, if you earn over thirty thousand dollars a year, like if you're living in the UK and you're educated, yeah, you're probably gonna be some of the richest in the richest one percent of people in the world. 
I mean, we we live so lucky over here. In some of the Eastern Europe or other parts of the world, even when it's cold, it's some serious poverty. You know, it's like life is hard in a lot of countries still. Most countries still. Yeah. Again, what you're trying to say, yeah. Mm. So that's just what, if you're brought up in a tough environment, the toughest people from a tough environment are more likely to be tougher than the toughest people from a softer environment. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? From the trenches. I mean... That's impressive though. Yeah. It's got some mad skills, not gonna lie. Yeah. Yeah. But I like Connor more. He's savage, man. He's, he's, he's so savage. He's too savage now, yeah. though. Okay. Have you seen the meme that has been recently going trending? When, when he tried to put a shoulder on Putin? Really? <laughs> yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah I did. Yeah. Well, it's the 2018 18. World Cup. He yeah. got invited as an official guest. Yeah to uh, Russia, yeah, and then the security stepped forward as he put his arm around him. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty gangster yes. trying to put your arm around Putin like that. <laughs> Did you see security was, has, what thought of coming in, in the front? He stepped in, he stepped yeah. in and then yeah. forward, didn't he? Yeah. Might have to edit this out, so I'd quite like to go to Moscow <laughs> at some point. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how the, uh, how the edit goes. Yeah. Do you want to pause and get some food? We're 40 minutes in. Yeah, let's yeah. pause. Okay, stop. We have to stop on your watch exactly the same time. Ready? Yeah. Pause. Three, two, one, go.